long does it take before a beard drives you absolutely nuts? The correct answer is three months. So there we go. Hey, birthday boy. Pete Egg. Happy birthday. Hey. hey. You don't look a year younger, so congratulations. We got some songs we're going to start off. Welcome to worship today. We've got a couple songs to get us in the mood today. Um, first one's Children of God. Join in with you, Abel. Praise to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ.
Today we have, we are coming together and we're celebrating with Lily. Where is she? There she is. And we're going to be celebrating her baptism here in just a few minutes. Before we do, though, we have some, just a little time to pause, some words for reflection this morning as we enter into this time of worship. I'm going to invite you to stand as you are able. Some words are on the screen. I ask you to respond with those words that are in the yellow or gold print. For being faithful when we are faithless. For being more ready to forgive than we are to ask. We praise your name. For rejoicing over one lost sinner who is found. We praise your name. Before we pray together, I'm going to ask you just to reflect a little bit on your journey this past week. Those times that you faced challenge, those times that you struggled, those times this past week. Maybe you wish you could have that moment over with those times to God at this time. Father in heaven, we confess that we have not followed your will and your ways. We have gone our own way, and only when desperate have we turn to you. We confess that we have not rejoiced when other people have received grace and forgiveness, but have been jealous instead. So my friends, your response is this today that God gives you. The Lord grieves when we hurt others and ourselves. God is always looking for us to turn to God to receive grace and mercy. Today you're going to hear some powerful scripture about the prodigal son. You're going to hear some powerful words that Pastor Julie brings about how that come, how God enters into our lives in new ways, sometimes when it's unexpected. So go forth this week knowing that God is always welcoming you in to a new day and to a new journey. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to invite our baptismal party and family to come forward. Today we're going to baptize Lily Ann Anderson here today, and she is ready to go. She's in her arms of her father, Nick. Shannon is next to Nick. Shannon and Nick are being married, getting married in October, and Shannon's looking forward to becoming a further stepmother to Lily. To my right, have her sponsors. See, they switched the order on me. <laughs> They're making me work. Natalie is Nick's sister, of course. She's our sponsor. Then we got Zach and Jocelyn and Jay. Actually, Jay, Jocelyn. Jay, uh, Zach at the end, right? Excellent. <laughs> Thank you for being sponsors today as you walk us out alongside Lily throughout her baptismal journey which is formally beginning today. As we come together in baptism, we come together saying promises, and we're being reminded of promises. First and foremost, we are celebrating the promise that God is making in Lily's life today. It's hard to imagine our children as sinful beings, but we're born into this condition. But by water and the word, God delivers us from sin and death, raises us to a new life in Jesus Christ. We're united with all the baptized into one body of Christ, anointed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, joined in God's mission for the life in the world. And today we're coming together and making those promises real in Lily's life. 
and celebrating them today. Nick and Shannon, called by the Holy Spirit, trusting in the grace and love of God, do you desire to have Lily baptized into Christ this day? If so, say, we do. As you bring her to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with these responsibilities and these promises. To live with her among God's faithful people, to bring her to the word of God, the Holy Supper, to teach her the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, the Ten Commandments, to place in her hands the Holy Scriptures, to nurture her in faith and prayer, so that she may learn to love and trust God Proclaim Christ through word and deed, care for others in the world that God has made, and to be a worker for justice and peace. Do you promise to help Lily grow in the Christian faith and life? If so, say we do. Sponsors, do you promise to nurture Lily in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Spirit to help her live in the covenant of baptism and in communion with the church? If so, say we do. People of God, all of you gathered here this day, do you promise to support Lily, pray for her in her new life in Christ? If so, say together, we do. We do. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters. And by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood, you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John, anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you set us free from the power of sin and death and raise us up to live in you. Pour out your Holy Spirit, the power of your living word, that those who are washed in the waters of baptism may be given new life. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Willie, come on over. So, Lily Marley Anderson, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's all right. You hang on to him like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> Let us pray. Give you thanks, O oh God, that through the water and the Holy Spirit you give your sons and daughters new birth, cleanse them from sin, raise them to eternal life. Sustain Lily with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of understanding spirit of counsel and might, spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence both now and forever. Amen. Lily Anderson, child of God, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen. We're going to light a candle. And Lily, this candle is yours. And this is a candle that we light in celebration of this day. And it's a reminder, not only for you, but all of us, that the light of Christ now burns inside of you. And that joy that God gives will never go away. <laughs> and nothing can ever take it away. And it's a reminder for us to let our light so shine before others that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. Dad, come with me for a minute. <laughs> we thought we'd see if this would be possible, but I'm not. We're just going to stay right there. We're going to stay right here. This is Lily. A lot of you have watched her grow up these last couple years. And she's now, she always has been, but now she really is your sister in Christ. Let's go back here so we can see him back here. And there's going to be some days, you know, there's going to be days when she is walking up to you and she says, you know, I need to be with someone else today. 
I need to be with someone else who can kind of guide me through this day. That's going to be your role. Tell her about this day. Remind her, you can come this way now, remind her that God's love is with her in all of her tears and all of her joys and all of her great moments and all her sad days. We're going to surround her with love and prayer as we do with all our kids who are baptized. So you tell her that when you see her, that she's loved very much and nothing will ever take that love away. we got some words going to come on the screen. You see him, Willie, up there? We're going to welcome you today. We welcome you into the body of Christ, into the mission we share. Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative meaning word to all the world. Shane, I'm going to give this to you. This is a blanket that was made for her. And uh, it's a reminder of this day. And you can take this home, Willie. Wrap yourself up around it. Make a tent with it. Whatever it is you do. There you go. And it's a reminder uh, of the love that the people have for, for you and that God surrounds you with every day. Let's welcome her around the applause. song today, Build Your Kingdom Here. Join me in our song today. Come set your rule and
We have some scripture in front of us today. Ron's going to read. Let me move for your Ron coming up. The Old Testament lesson <clears throat> is found in the book of Joshua. By celebrating the Passover and eating the produce of the promised land instead of the miraculous manna that had sustained them in the desert, the Israelites symbolically bring their 40 years of wilderness wandering to an end at Gilgal. From chapter 5, the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you to the disgrace of Egypt, and so that place is called Gilgal to this day. <clears throat> While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. The Gospel lesson is taken from the 15th chapter of Luke's Gospel. Jesus tells a parable about a son who ponders his father's love only after he has spurned it. The grace he receives is beyond his hopes. That same grace is a crisis for an older brother who believed it was his obedience that earned his place in the father's home. We read, now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, Give me the share of the property that would belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands had bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. 
and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours come, came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. In today's Gospel reading, this passage that is usually known as the story of the prodigal son, it is a father who throws a party for his son who after squandering his inheritance, finds himself without money, without food, without shelter, in the midst of a severe famine, and in his hunger returns to his father, much to, to the disbelief and the anger of the eldest son. The elder son, who has remained faithful to the family farm, who has remained faithful to his father all these years, is wondering, why a homecoming for this ne'er-do-well brother of mine? As we hear this story, our question often echoes that of the older brother. Is it fitting to throw a party for a prodigal son? Perhaps a fresher understanding of this story begins when we define who in this story is the real prodigal. Usually we speak of the younger brother as the prodigal. He treats his own father as if he were dead by asking for his inheritance early. He then travels to a distant land. He squanders everything his father has ever given him immediately on loose living. The son is wasteful. He is wasteful with the opportunities that have been given him. He is wasteful with money. He is wasteful with his inheritance. He is wasteful even with his youthfulness. And if these poor decisions are not enough to break his father's heart, his Jewish son has found a job feeding pigs, unclean animals. It would seem that the son is determined to turn his back on his father and all that his father loves in order to satisfy his own desires. I suppose the less obvious answer to who is the prodigal in this story is the son who remains at home while he does not ask for an early inheritance, he does resent quietly being the one left at home to tend the family farm and abide by his father's wishes. When speaking to his father, he refers to his younger brother who has returned, not as my brother, but as this son of yours. All he can see is that his father's welcome and forgiveness of his younger brother has been an extravagant waste. Yet this parable ends with the older brother also being lost. He is lost because of his envy. He is lost because of his pride. He is lost because of the judgmental attitudes and his resentment over his father's generosity toward his younger brother. In each case, neither son really shows any regard or concern for their father's feelings. 
So who is the prodigal in this story? Is it the younger son? Is it the older son? Perhaps it is neither. Perhaps the real prodigal in this story is the father. The father is a prodigal in that his love is more extravagant and more excessive than either the younger son loose living or the older son judgmental attitudes. The father is persistent. He is excessive. He is a prodigal in his effort to claim these two children as his own again and again, to proclaim that this is a family. It is the father who embarrasses himself, who hikes up his robe, who runs across the field in order to meet this son who deemed him dead so long ago, who has wasted every gift that he has ever been given. And what is the father's response when that one son returns home, when that one coin that was lost is found, when that one sheep is brought back to the fold of 99? The father's response is joy. Pure joy, a joy that fills the father's house with music and feasting and dancing and laughter. God is like that father, Jesus says. And that makes us angry sometimes. Theologian Thomas Long asks this, isn't it strange? Isn't it strange that so many of us who are committed Christians stay outside the father's house of joy because we're angry at the younger brother? Isn't it something how we stay outside the joy and ever keeping it from permeating our soul? Because like the older brother in this gospel lesson, we will ask, what's that noise? A party for my brother? A party for that ne'er-do-good fella who threw his father's money away while we tried to stay back and make something of our lives? And the eldest son speaks honestly to his father. You never gave a party for me. I've always wanted to be joyful, but you never welcomed me. You never gave a party for me. You never even gave me a young goat, and here you are killing the fatted calf for my brother. And then comes this amazing, gracious reply from the father, son, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. Everything. There has always been a party going on in my heart for you, even though you could not see it. So come into the house of joy. Thomas Long further reflects on the father's loving response. I think that part of what this is saying to us is that we never really experience the joy of our faith until we realize that we are all prodigal sons and daughters. We are all outside and have been invited into that party of joy through no merit of our own, even though we do not deserve it. A number of years ago now, I attended a youth ministry conference at Willow Creek Community Church near Chicago. One of the keynote speakers at the conference was an author by the name of Donald Miller. Donald Miller has since grown into great popularity as an author and as a speaker. He is about my age. He's known for his extremely candid and forthright <laughs> writings about his tumultuous life of faith as a Christian. And during the conference, he shared with us a story, a prodigal story that I want to share with you again today. I shared this once about nine years ago. I pray that it bears another hearing. I share it in the hope that it might touch someone else's life. It has certainly touched mine again and again. The story. The other day, Donald said, I was talking with a dear friend of mine who is going through a divorce. He and his soon-to-be ex-wife and have two children. Both of them are now teenagers. 
My friend says he feels torn and devastated by the divorce, and even worse, if that's possible, about what has been happening in the life of his 16-year-old daughter. Donald, his friend said, I am really worried about my kids, our daughter in particular. Since their mother and I told them about our divorce, our daughter has been spending a whole lot of time with this young man from her school. She has a whole new set of friends suddenly. And she's really into that gothic look, you know? She's dyed her blonde hair completely black. She's painted her nails black. She and her boyfriend wear black lipstick, and she only wears black clothing. I'm really worried. It's not only that her appearance has drastically changed. Her whole way of being in the world has changed, not to mention her attitude. She hardly talks to me now, and when she does, it's only a few simple words muttered under her breath. She used to be this wonderful, happy, delightful, engaging person, and now she is just, I don't know. I feel like I'm losing my daughter, and I don't know what to do. And Donald replied, you need to give your daughter a better story. A what? His friend asked. Haven't you been listening to what I said? A better story. What do you mean a better story? Donald replied, you are her dad. It is your responsibility to give your daughter a better story. But my wife and I have tried. You haven't been listening to me. Our marriage is over. That ship has sailed. Yep, that's right, Donald said. And that's not the story that I'm talking about. That part of the story has, has ended. But now you and your children, and right now your daughter in particular, need a whole new story. And she's looking to you, her dad, to give it to her. Within a few days of their conversation, Donald's friend called a family meeting with his two children. Together they sat at the kitchen table in their dad's new apartment. He brought out a map of Africa and laid it out on the table. He said, kids, you see this country in Africa? Yeah, they said. Well, right here in this country in Africa, right now people are dying because they have no access to clean water. And they have no clean water. And if they don't have clean water to drink and to cook with and to feed their animals, they're all going to die. Yeah. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to Africa. We're going to build fresh water wells in Africa. Dad thought he might have seen them look at each other. He even thought he saw a smile possibly come across his daughter's face. In order to get there, he said, we will have to raise money. We will have to work hard to pay for our plane tickets our expenses. I know that we can do this. It was not even one week later, Donald said, that the man's daughter decided to break up with her boyfriend. She began spending time with her old friends. She started to look like herself again. She started to act more and more like herself. And right away, that day, she began telling her friends, her neighbors, and anyone else who would listen that she was going to spend part of her summer vacation in Africa digging freshwater wells. She no longer needed this new look. She didn't need this new set of friends. What she needed was to be invited into a different story. A story where she was needed just as she was, where God accepted her just as she was, where she could have purpose and being in the world just as God had made her. That is the kind of story that we are given through the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A better story is given to us every single day by a God who, like a woman has, who has lost one of her silver coins, will not rest until she finds it. 
A story of a God who, like a shepherd, will not stop searching until he finds that one lost sheep because the 99 who have been found aren't whole until that one comes back. This is a God who, when the world says, yeah, forget about that good-for-nothing son or daughter, will hike up his robe, will come running to welcome us home with a prodigal love. Amen. today. We're just going to have some spoken prayers today, Pete. We lift up a few folks we want to remember, especially. Pray for Doug Kulka, who's a friend of Berger and Phyllis Eklov, has some health concerns. Pray for Larry Strongstelin. Larry had a heart attack this past week, hospitalized. We pray for Leona Hawkinson, who was hospitalized as well today. A lot of other folks in our lives we know who are going through some difficult times. We hold them in prayers. And though for those who grieve today as well, families of Irvin Olson, families of Bob Burris. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, for all those journeys that we took off in, didn't know what we were getting ourselves into, we give you thanks for welcoming us back home with friends and family and loved ones, and first and foremost, a God who says, I am with you and nothing will ever take you away. For those ones in our lives who have made bad decisions and we've struggled with how to welcome them back home and to love them again and to make them whole, we pray that you give us courage in those encounters and openness in our hearts and minds. For those who struggle this day, we pray for healing for Doug, for Larry, for Leona, 
for so many others upon our hearts and minds. And for the families that grieve, for Bob's family and Irvin's family, and for all of us who walk in these tender days of, great, of, of grief, whether it's to spend a few days or weeks or better to spend years and years. Lead us into a new day, a new story, and new adventures. For these things and all other things upon our hearts, we lift to you, trusting in your never-ending grace in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll receive our offering this day. Our kids are welcome to come forward to some change. Going towards God's global barnyard, we're on our way to a cow and hopefully to a whole barnyard for a family in need. Thank you for all your gifts. stand as you are able as we prepare for communion this day. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, he said, take and eat, this is my body given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you, for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered and won by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It is a kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. 
On this day and all our days, may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ forever strengthen you, keep you in his grace and peace. Amen. We have some communion visitors. I'm going to invite you to come forward and receive your communion kits this morning. Let's pray, good and gracious God, for these dear ones who, whom we go and visit. Keep them, keep them whole and in our love. May this body and blood that goes to them revive them and strengthen them for the days ahead as it does for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> We're ten minutes over, so just take a breath. <laughs> May you go forth this day in all those places that you're going to encounter people in need, for all those places that you're going to take your own needs into those places, know that Christ walks with you, welcomes you home, and says to all of us every day, you who once were lost, you now are found, and we celebrate and we feast with you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. And then they'll send us home on a great song. Why don't we stand and sing together? Peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Carry your peace as you go this day.